tonight's message is stop playing games. I love these things that pop up behind me. Oh, I want that on a t-shirt, that's great. You know, as PT so perfectly and, and, and in such great alignment spoke of on Sunday, if you haven't had a chance, please make sure you check out the podcast or the YouTube of this Sunday's message, Kings and Queens. It's, a, it's the beginning of a powerful series. So for those of you who are clapping, you already know. Make sure you check that thing out. It really is going to set the tone for this coming season. And there's something to accepting the royalty of who you are that means you can't play no more. Because kings and queens don't play games. You know, maybe the people in positions under them have the leeway to do so, but when you have dominion and you have responsibility, it means the time to play games has ended. And it becomes a very interesting moment where, as adults, we have to grow up again. You know, we have this idea that we've already grown up because we're adulting. But real adulting means you continue to have to grow up over and over and over and over and over. The maturing process isn't something that has a cap on it, which means when you're 95, if you are willing if your mind is able to surrender completely to what God has for you at 95, you can receive a blessing that takes you to a whole other level. But I don't want us to have to wait till 95. We can start right now. So stop playing games. It's a two-part series. I'll be back next, next week to do the second half of this. But I want to start with part one, and I call part one the promise. There's two parts to how this season where we eliminate the gamesmanship are going to be. The first part is the promise. Next Wednesday, I'll jump into it. The second part is the warning. But we're going to start with the promise first. When I think of playing games, uh, the first person in the word that comes to mind is Jacob. Because Jacob, if you are familiar with his story, Jacob starts off basically playing games. He's literally known, his, his name is literally translated as the one who grasps the heel. So he's trying to play games. He's trying to clown around. He's tripping people up. So he starts off playing games. And it's interesting how God chooses to deal with him because In the midst of him playing games, God had to set him down so that he could understand that there was a time and a place and a season where he could get away with it. But then after that point, he couldn't get away with it anymore. So my challenge, I dare would call it homework, is I'm not going to read every single verse of of uh, of Jacob's story. But if you read Genesis chapters 27 through the very end of the Bible, (laughs) you will get like the whole of everything. You get Jacob and the generations after. It's a great read. Trust me. But if you just want to hear about Jacob, go through chapters 27 to 29, and you get the whole story of Jacob and, and who he was and how he developed So I've got three points that I want to make sure we hone in on as we are entering the season where we just, we're not going to play games anymore. We don't have time for the the immaturity of playing games with destiny and playing games with purpose. There just is no more time for that. When I was a child, I played with childish things, but as I became older, I had to put those things away. And so I want to actually start with Genesis chapter 27, verses 27 through 29. Set the stage very quickly. This is Jacob right at the beginning of his journey. Now, up until this point, Jacob and his brother Esau had had a back and forth exchange where Esau, 
who was older and supposed to be the one who received the firstborn blessing, he got tricked out of it because Jacob was playing games. And so this is actually a part of that entire uh, event and how it unfolded. You see, Isaac, his father, was so old, he was blind at this point. And so when it was time for the sons to come forward to receive the blessing, there were certain characteristic, characteristics that Isaac was looking for so that he could identify the sons. Now, Jacob knew this. And Jacob, knowing this, makes sure that he doesn't come close enough so that Isaac can, ident- can identify him because he's trying to take his brother's blessing. And he knows if he gets too close, he's going to get found out. And so it reads, and he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son. Now he's speaking, or at least he thinks he's speaking, of Esau. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Keep going. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Esau had an amazing blessing. Keep going. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. I want you to remember this because this we're going to come back to this. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Now I want to unpack a few things before we go forward. Can we go back to uh, verse 27? So, as I mentioned, Isaac is looking out for characteristics that will define Esau because he can't use his sight. It says he came near, he kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him. You see, when Jacob and Esau were born, it was said of them, there were, there were characteristics, defining characteristics so that you knew the difference between the two. It was said of Esau that Esau was a man of the field. And it was said of Jacob that he was a dweller of tents. So basically, you've got an outdoorsman and you got an indoor guy. Now, if you have someone who spends time in the fields, who toils and labors in the fields, there's a smell that they have to them because they are always in the fields. Whether it's dirt, whether it's mud, it could be fresh grass, whatever it is, there is a smell to someone who is always working in the fields. There's a smell to someone who has laid hold of their identity in full and is working in purpose and in destiny. There is a smell. There's an aroma. There's an there's an essence about them that makes them immediately identifiable even when they're not doing what you think they're doing. So Esau was a man of the field. He spent his formative years in the field. And his father knew this. So his father said, you don't even need to get close to me. I just, I smell you. I know it. I can smell the fields on you. Jacob knew this. And Jacob was not about to go out in the fields. Because it could have been easy. He could have rolled around in some dirt and said, it's me. But it wouldn't have worked. Because just because you spend five minutes, just because you spend 25 seconds walking out a little bit of destiny, that doesn't mean you have become your destiny. (laughs) Just because you get a little mud on your shoe doesn't mean all of a sudden you're an outdoorsman. (laughs) And Jacob knew this. And Jacob's mother knew this. So what Jacob's mother did, which was brilliant, said, you know what? I don't have time to turn you into an outdoorsman. I don't. Time's a wasting this window for this blessing that I'm trying to manipulate for you. This window is closing, so we got to act fast. So she takes Esau's clothes, puts them on Jacob. So now Jacob smells like Esau. The first point, the first thing that we need to concentrate on Now that we have stopped playing games, it's time for you to start smelling like your destiny. People ought to walk past you and go, do you write? 
you start having those moments when people walk up to you and start telling you all about you. They've never met you, but because you are in your environment, because you are walking in your identity, and because you are in there so often, the smell of it is just on you. People walk by, are you a dancer? All you're doing is walking down the street in your nice new kicks. All of a sudden, oh my God. Do you trade stocks? Like, it's just all over you. (laughs) One of the things that used to freak me out when I was younger is I would tell people, they would ask me what what I did, and I'd be like, I'm an actor. And they would believe it. But they'd never seen me act. Years later, they'd be like, oh yeah, I knew you would do that. I'm like, well, couldn't you have told me? But because that is just who I was. That was where I spent my time. You see, there's something to where you toil, where you work, where your environment is, where you are honing your discipline, where you grind. You can't grind in your bedroom all the time. You can't grind in the kitchen with your cup of coffee. You can't grind on the couch watching TV. You can't grind when you're taking a shower. You can't grind while you nap. I know I hurt somebody's feelings, y'all love the nap. I was on fire and then I said the nap. He was like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey. You talk about my nap. My nap is real. But there's something to where you are and how much time you spend there that changes the aura, the essence, the aroma about you. And so if we're going to stop playing games, that means we need to start being in the places where our destiny and our identity calls us to be. And I'm not saying just be out there to be out there. That's different. That's a whole other, that's a whole other lane. Where has your destiny and your purpose, where has the promise that God called over your life called you to be? What do those environments look like? And if you don't know, find people who are already there and find out where they go because they have the smell all over them. And it's not because they bought the the fragrance at a store and, and walked around with it. They spent the time, they did the work, they looked and they said, this is where I need to be planted. And when you plant yourself in soil, when it's time to come out of the ground, you can't help but smell like soil. If we're not going to play games anymore, we can't walk around with the smell of somebody else's destiny on us. I can't have the smell of somebody else's destiny on me. This does me no good. Because what happens is, when I walk past the person who is looking for my unique aura, my unique aroma, the aroma that God has called for me to have, when I walk past and the person that God has appointed and anointed to discover that and say whatever needs to be said so that this interaction needs to take place, if I've got somebody else's aroma, I won't be recognized. So now I'm blocking my own blessing because I want someone else's aroma. You have a unique smell of destiny that you have to lay hold of and you have to keep it and it is all yours. It smells nothing like anybody else. And people should walk past you and just get a whiff of it. We're ready to do destiny. We're ready to do work. Purpose needs to be taken hold of. I just walked past you. I felt it. I smell it on you. Let's work. This is what happens when you stop playing games because all of a sudden you find the discipline to be exactly where you're supposed to be for every long hour that you need to be there. People are clocking out. You haven't left. People are clocking in. You still haven't left. People come back and forth like it's a job. You live there. That's how you start to smell like destiny. The first thing we have to do, we got to start smelling like our destiny. (laughs) 
Can we go back to uh, verse 28? Chapter 27, verse 28. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, plenty of grain and wine. Keep going, keep going. Let peoples serve you. Ooh. That's almost a whole other word. I'm trying to make sure y'all get out of here for parking. Let people serve you. We're going to do this quick. If you're going to stop playing games, there's a false humility that has to go. We get into this mode of humility where we are in such a mind and a heart for service, and it's pure, and it's wonderful, and it's real, and you keep that. That is what eventually allows you to lead. But once you are called to lead, you now have to let peoples serve you. Two parts to that. Number one, it's time to delegate responsibility. You cannot do every single thing all on your own. Let peoples serve you. That means it's time to hand out responsibility, which means it's time to take note of what responsibilities need to be taken care of. It's housekeeping that's got to happen if you're going to stop playing games. Because when you're a one-man shop, you can do it all on your own in any order, and the only person that affects it's you. But when it's time to be a king and a queen, your kingdom is not just about you. It's time to equip people so that they can serve you. And not just serve you, serve the vision and the destiny that God has put inside of you. Because ultimately, that's what people are going to serve. Let peoples serve you. And when God has put you in that position, you're worthy of it. That's the false humility part we also need to get rid of. You're worthy of it. You wouldn't be in that position if you weren't. So just get over it. You have favor on you. Get over it. (laughs) Somebody else doesn't have that favor. Tough. Get over it. This is your favor. Your homeboy doesn't have that favor. I'm sorry. Get over it. You have favor. Your homeboy has his own favor. Your homegirl has her own favor. But you need to work and live out your favor, which means you need to let people serve you. And nations bow down to you, be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. The second piece that I want us to concentrate on now that we have stopped playing games is focus on his promise. Now, this is interesting. There's two parts to this. Because... Jacob received Esau's promise. This was not originally meant for him, but he managed to manipulate his way into this position where he has now received someone else's promise. Now, the wild part about it is God honored this, but God didn't honor this because of Jacob. He honored it because of Isaac. You see, sometimes People who are anointed and in your life have a promise, and you are a part of that promise. And whether you feel you are worthy of it or not, God is honoring that person, not you. When we find ourselves in moments where we are blessed and we have no idea where it came from, And you look back on what you've done, and you've done the antithesis of what should bring forth a blessing. And you say, I don't know where this came from. I can't possibly have done this. You're right, you didn't. But be glad and be prayerful and be thankful that you are in a circle because God honored somebody in your circle. God honored someone in your environment. God honored someone in your soil. God honored someone in your field where you were out working trying to get the aroma on you. God had to honor someone around you and that is why you just received that blessing. Long story short, 
get around blessed people. Because getting around blessed people will teach you how to act and how to carry and how to respond to being blessed. So the second thing I want to make sure we hold to is to stay focused on God's promise. This was placed over Jacob even though it was Esau's blessing. I want to move to Genesis 28. Now, as I said earlier, the previous blessing that we read was what he was what he received that was Esau's. Isaac bestowed this upon who was supposed to be his older son. Now, even though this came about in a way that was shady, God had to honor the man of God in this equation. And so, with that being said, if Jacob was going to move forward, he could not move forward having laid hold of someone else's anointed blessing. He had to have his own. So at this point, Jacob has fled because Esau has caught on to what's going on, and Esau is mad. And what we also need to understand is earlier we talked about the personalities of the two men. Esau was a man of the field, which means he could use his hands. He was used to getting dirty, and he was mad. <laughs> Jacob was mild-mannered, I believe is what the word said about him, and he dwelled in tents. So this matchup is just not very favorable for Jacob. So Jacob did the smart thing, and he ran. So he is on the run, so to speak. Little does he realize he's literally running towards the destiny that God has for him. So Jacob finds himself in a field. His head is laying on a stone. He's dreaming. He's getting that good sleep that you get when you know you just avoided a butt whooping. And he sees this vision, it blows his mind. There's a, a, a ladder that extends from earth to heaven. There's angels running up and down. And then God starts talking to him. This is what God says. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Now, this was all a part of God's plan. You would figure Jacob would be getting punished because he managed to manipulate and trick his way into a destiny that we think isn't his. But God always has a way of making things that are crooked straight. This started off so shady and so crooked but this was a part of God's plan. The best part is, as we get into it a little later, you see exactly what God has to do to Jacob to straighten him. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Next verse. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, Got that good Abraham promise on him. Come on, somebody. Oof. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Man, how do shady people get blessed? <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I read this. But wait, there's more. Next verse, behold, I am with you. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. This is huge. This is why the second important thing that we have is to focus on his promise. And by focus, I mean 
find a way so that you are always staring at the promise that God has put over your life. I don't care if you have to write it down. I don't care if you have to paint it. I don't care if you have to draw it. If you have to type it, post it on your wall, whatever it takes, find a way so that at least once a day you are staring at the promise that God has put over your life. Because this is the very beginning of an epic trial. And it's a trial that when you read it in the word seems to pass by that quick. But when you break down the different segments, you see where Jacob gets worked over. And everything he did to get to where he was, he eventually has to pay for in spades. You want to make sure you are holding on to this promise. Because if you don't hold on to God's promise, you will not get through the process. Everything that happened to Jacob from this point forward, the only reason Jacob made it through was because he had this promise in him and on him. The irony of this is Jacob, who is not known as a man of the field. Remember, Esau was the man of the field. So Jacob takes on someone else's anointing. Here's the problem. When you take on someone else's anointing, you take on their work. Now you have to do destiny in alignment with who they are. And that will war with who you are. So now you are literally living internal conflict because you have a destiny that you have to walk out, but then you have a purpose that's yours that you also have to work out. And when there's conflict, when there's friction, you see what happens with Jacob. I'll paraphrase, like I said, when you have the the time, read chapters 27 through 29, amazing. So Jacob finds himself in this field. God makes this incredible promise to him. The next thing that happens is he discovers the stream. He meets his eventual wife, Rachel. It's so romantic. It's so sweet. It's amazing. He shows up. Rachel is a shepherdess. She's bringing her sheep and her goats, and he rolls over the stone, and he feeds the the sheep and the goat, he waters them, and then he just goes up to her, kisses her, and that's it. They're married. It's it's away we go. (laughs) Incredible. This sounds great. On paper, this looks amazing. I'm like, man, Jacob is getting over right now. (laughs) I don't get it. He jacks his brother's anointing. The next thing you know, he's laying in a field. God is talking to him. He gets up. His wife just walks up to him with a whole bunch of sheep and goats. That means she's rich. Now he's balling. This is amazing stuff. Jacob is really having a great time right now. But wait to see what happens next. Because Jacob finds himself as a man of the field. His brother Esau was known as the man of the field. And yet, once he meets Rachel, his life changes completely. We are not dwelling in tents anymore. Jacob, it's time to work. So Jacob finds himself working for his uncle Laban, which is another amazing meeting. They meet, Laban sees him, he kisses him. Oh my God, you're my nephew. Oh my God, you're my uncle. And this all looks great on paper. And then the work began. Laban asks him, he says, name your wage. If you're going to serve me, that's cool. You name your wage. Jacob says, look, I'll work for you for seven years. Your daughter's beautiful. I'm in love with her. How about we work this thing out? I work for seven years. You promise her to me. We get married. I leave the end. Perfect. So he stays for a month. And then he strikes this agreement. He works for seven years in the field where he's not supposed to be in the field where he's not qualified to be? See, if Esau was in the field, he probably wouldn't have sweated nothing because he's a man of the field. It's no big deal. See, Jacob, Jacob had to sweat a little bit because he's not supposed to be there. This is not his type of work. So now that which is supposed to be easy is suddenly an incredible struggle. 
This is what happens when you find yourself outside of your destiny and someone else's. All of a sudden, the work that you are supposed to be doing that should be leading you towards destiny becomes work that is killing you. Now, it says in the word that when Jacob first worked, when he worked for the first seven years, see, notice I said first. If you haven't read the story, you know what's coming next. For the first seven years, he worked and worked and worked. But it said those first seven years passed by like nothing because he was in love. He loved Rachel so much that the first seven years, it was like a, a mere few days. And then it was time to claim his bride. And Laban decided no. Hate it when that happens. But shady is as shady does. I have no idea why Jacob thought that he could live a life and be shady and then strike an agreement with a stranger and expect the shade not to come back to him. I don't get it. But he did. And Laban taught him an incredibly powerful lesson. Watch who you make agreements with. Because the minute they meet you, oh, I love you so much, you're so great, you're so awesome, I love you, love your work. I love all you do, I love your productivity. I love all of this increase that you're bringing me. And then when the agreement was over, when there was nobody to till the land, when there was no longer going to be someone to herd the sheep, it got shady. All of a sudden, Laban says, you know what? Not so much. I'm thinking what should really happen is you are going to marry my other daughter. And not only are you going to marry her, but if you want to marry the daughter, I promise you originally you're going to have to work for what? Seven more years. And the crazy part is, he did it <laughs> because he was in love, loved Rachel, even though he was promised to marry this woman who he did not want to marry, he did it anyway. Now, all of a sudden, what looked like skipping through lilies is starting to become a very difficult life. See, Jacob's not a man of the field. He's in the field. Jacob wanted one wife. He's got two. I'm going to say that part again, two. I love the increase of the Lord, but two. Two wives, that's... I'm glad a few of you were able to fill in the blank for me. I appreciate that. It was too much. Man and wife is a covenant. That means you are joined to somebody. You weren't meant to be split in two and joined to two people. Remember, this hard work. He's not a man of the field. Now he's in the field. He's shepherding goats and sheep for his uncle. Not for himself, for his uncle. And he's got two wives. And now Jacob finds himself in the middle of a competition because the wives want babies. Leah pops out three babies. Her sister looks over and is like, oh, you can pop out babies? I want to pop out babies too. And at the end of it all, Jacob, tent dweller, had 13 kids and two wives, and a lot of goats and sheep that did not belong to him. See what happens when you're shady? <laughs> Think about it the next time you want to start off something shady, because it may not come back to you in that moment, but you just wait two, three, four, five, eight, nine, ten seasons. It's coming back in spades. So Jacob finds himself in this wild position where now he's in the middle of a baby war. 
and there's, he's got the two wives, the maids get involved. All of this is happening to him, and he can't figure out quote unquote why. What fascinates me is that he stayed. He could have run at any given point in time, but he stayed. What causes you to stay when life looks nothing like what you thought it was going to look like? What causes you to stick it out when difficulty after difficulty after change in scenery after change in the plan all of these things start to happen. Jacob showed up to, you know, be with his uncle for a month and take one wife home. One month, take the wife home. 20 years later, he's got two wives, 13 kids, and an uncle who don't like him no more. <laughs> and yet throughout all of this, Jacob stayed. Why does Jacob stay? Because Jacob remembered the promise that God made him. And the best part of that promise, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I've done what I have spoken to you. I don't care if it's five years. I don't care if it's 10 years. I don't care how many shady uncles you have. I don't care about how many wives and maids want to put you in the middle of their business. I am with you. So all of this turmoil that is swirling around is not going to harm you the way it would harm somebody else because I am with you. Right. Jacob, whoo, he got it stretched out. But I love this because God had to do all of these things to him. He had to endure all of these things because the one problem Jacob had was that it started shady and it could not continue that way. So this thing called life happens where lessons have to be learned and patience has to be developed. 20 years. He was supposed to be there one month. He stayed 20 years. That brings me to my third and final point. Learn. You have to recognize when a test is of man and a test is of God. Recognize God's tests versus man's tests. Here's how you know Jacob's encounter was a God test. Despite everything I've told you, when this experience was over, Jacob increased. Everything he went through, Jacob increased. When Jacob met Rachel and eventually was led to Rachel's father, who was his uncle, the only reason he went was for a wife. When Jacob was finished, he had birthed the 13 tribes of Israel. He went with no sheep and no goats. When he left, he had all of Laban's sheeps, sheep and goats. He went in with nothing and came out with everything. That's the difference between a God test and a man test. God will test you to build you, to increase you. When man tests you, it's usually not to increase you. If anything, it's to increase the person who's testing you. That's how you can snuff a man test out. When man is testing you, and all of a sudden the rules start changing, because God doesn't change the rules. God doesn't start changing the agreement. When God's word lands on you, it sticks. God honors the word and the contract that he has for his people to the letter. Laban decided that when the agreement fit him best, he was going to start to switch the arrangement. Now remember, Jacob had to do seven years of labor 
for Rachel, wound up doing seven years for Leah. Then he did seven more years for Rachel. Now, he was there for 20. Where did the other six go? He still had to do six more years of labor because Laban kept changing the terms of the agreement over and over. It says at the end of their exchange, he changed that agreement 10 times. 10 times. See what happens when you trick somebody out of their birthright? All he had to do was just give Esau the soup and be on his way. But he decided he was going to use that soup as leverage for a birthright, and he didn't know what he was getting himself into. Because I promise if he had seen all of this coming, he would have said, ooh, you can have the soup. Do you want some more meat? You get room. You can, I'll give you my clothes. You can have whatever you want. But I don't want all that at the end of it. But little did he know all of that is eventually what God used to bless him. You see, in 20 years, when this is over, the next thing that Jacob, that Jacob does, I love it. The next encounter Jacob has is he goes to make up with his brother Esau. It took 20 years of this experience to get Jacob to the place where he understood it was time to stop playing games. I can't manipulate people anymore and expect to move forward in this promise that God has for me. I wish it didn't take 20 years for him. I wish it didn't sometimes take 20 years for us. But however long it takes, as long as we keep our focus on the promise that God has over our lives, then we endure. And when we are done enduring, we increase. If nothing else, Jacob learned to be humble. Sit down. Be humble. Sit down. Be humble. Sit down. Because he was going to keep going just as he was. So God had to put a pause on how he thought life should be and introduce him to what a real anointed life looks like, which is struggle, trial, endurance, strength building, patience, prayer, and a lethal hold on to the promise. One of the things I also want to make sure we understand is there is going to be frustration. Jacob didn't skip through lilies. He was mild-mannered, but don't get it twisted. He was mad. Let's go to Genesis 31. Now, I love this exchange because this is the big kind of uh, settle-up moment between him and Laban. Laban catches him. Jacob finally runs. He leaves. Here's another quick point. When you're in the midst of God testing you, pay attention to the signs around you. God will tell you when it's time to go, but it's not always going to be you sitting there and then this thundering sound comes from above and he says, go. (laughs) Like, no. (laughs) It's not going to be. It might be, but it's not always going to be like that. There is attention that has to be paid for the time to strike. Even in the beginning of this exchange, when Jacob's mother, Rebecca, finds out that it's time for Esau to be blessed, do you know how it happened? She just happened to be around, and she was listening, and she heard her husband say, it's time for me to bless my sons. And she said, wait a minute. Now. We got to move now. She was paying attention. The same thing happens with Jacob. After 20 some odd years, there's an incident with sheep and goats. I would love to try to explain it, but I'll leave you to read it for yourself. But Laban tries to switch the deal one more time. And this is how you know how to handle the difference between a God test and a man test. Jacob said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to do this your way. You have an amendment? I've got one too. Here's what we're going to do. 
any sheep or goats that are speckled or striped, they're mine. Now, normally, speckled and striped goats or sheep are ones that are thought to have defects. They're thought to be the weaker of the bunch, the weaker of the group. He said, you know what, I'll take those. I got those. And Laban was like, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> the worst part was he was already getting over, but Laban couldn't help it because he had already been in the, ha at the habit of being shady. He goes, he takes all the speckled and the, and the striped goats and sheep, and he gives them to his other sons. And he tells his sons, go at least three days away from where we are. Here's Laban changing the agreement, but he didn't know this time he was messing with God. See, all those other times, God allowed what needed to happen to Jacob because Jacob needed to be developed. Jacob had to learn to stop playing these games. But when the lesson was over, when instruction time ended, God put a stop to all of it. So now there's nothing left but smooth sheep and goats. And Jacob is like, what is this? Jacob takes the smooth sheep and the goats. He takes them by these plants. I'm going to try to explain it as best as possible, but you should read it. It's pretty awesome. Takes the sheep by these plants. The, the plants have speckles on them. Every time the sheep and the goats mate, they see the plant. All of a sudden, they have speckles on them too. So all of these sheep and goats, which did not have anything on them, suddenly are mating and reproducing more speckles and more sheep that have the stripes and the speckles on them. All of a sudden, multiplication and increase is taking place in his life supernaturally because it was time for God's test to end. It was time for him to move forward in his destiny. It was time for him to get dirty and get muddy and get the aroma of his real personality and his real essence on him. It was time for him to move. So supernatural things began to happen. It was time for destiny to start. It was time for purpose to begin. It was for time for Jacob to go and move forward into eventually becoming Israel. So the time was now. So all of a sudden, the sheep and the goats are all reproducing, and now he has a whole flock. He has a flock bigger, bigger than his uncles ever, 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 ever was. And yet, he doesn't leave yet. I love it because in the word, it literally says he happens to be walking by the sons, Laban's sons. Laban's sons say, hey, Jacob, you looking a little rich over there, bruh. <laughs> Flock's looking kind of thick. Got a lot going on. Our uncle is looking kind of broke. They're not happy. So he hears that one thing. The next thing it says in the word is he encounters Laban. Laban didn't even say anything. His countenance had changed. And Jacob was like, whoop, time to go. Literally his words, it is time to go. He grabs his wives. He says, listen, your father is not happy with me. It's time we go. So they took everything and ran. Laban catches up with them. And then we have this exchange where they have it out. And we'll get into this more next Wednesday when we speak about Laban. I got to do it because y'all got to get in your cars. I ain't trying to have y'all locked up and then you want to pray. And no, you got to pray on bigger things than get into your car. So we have Jacob and Laban in this last exchange. And now all of this time, Jacob has done this and he has not complained until this moment. Thus, I have been in your house 20 years I have served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. Keep going. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands. Remember, this is a tent dweller. All of a sudden, he starts talking like he works as a man of the fields. His language has changed. This mild-mannered man is not mild-mannered anymore. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Now, what he's speaking of is this. The night before, Laban grabs his people up and says, we're going to go hunt down and find Jacob. God speaks to him and says, okay, you can find him, but um, you're not going to say anything foul to him. That's the Ebb translation. 
you are not going to say a cross word to him. Don't touch my anointed. Don't lay your tongue on my anointed. Not a foul word on my anointed because it is time for him to go because I have appointed this time as now for him to move forward. Don't put a word on my anointed. Now, you can see from this exchange, he was heated. This is 20 years of frustration bubbling up. Why am I bringing up this point? Because in the midst of your God test, don't be fooled if you get frustrated. You're supposed to get frustrated. But as long as you are holding on to the promise that God has for you, that frustration becomes fuel. And that fuel is what keeps you moving and it keeps you working and it keeps you toiling. And as you work more and you toil more, you get more of the smell on you that you're supposed to have. It's not about being frustrated. It's what do you do with it? There's no use pretending that you're not frustrated when you are because God sees your heart anyway. And that's a whole different problem because God is not going to deal with the version of your heart that you think you should have. He's going to deal with the version of your heart that is in that moment right now. So my word for you is this. When it's time to stop playing games, are you going to be frustrated? Yep. Are you going to be put in uncomfortable positions? Believe it. Will you have to atone for things of your past that you thought you'd gotten away with? Oh, yeah. Believe it. But endure knowing that he is with you and he will not leave you. And the promise that was over your life before you were even born. Not only is he going to honor it, unlike shady people, he's not going to change the agreement. Every letter of the promise that God has over your life is going to be honored in full when you stop playing games. Let's stand. We'll continue the rest of it next week. Right now, we're in a moment where once you declare the games are over, once you declare that you have subscribed to the fullness of God's reality over your life, it's time to sow into that moment, not only with your heart and not only with your lips, but as we saw With Jacob being a man of the field, your feet have to do the walking. Right now, I want to call some people down to this altar. If you know, if you know you've been playing games with the destiny God has called over your life, putting it off, not really putting the fullness of your faith and your effort into it, if you've just been playing with it, you kind of, you indulge it for five or ten minutes, but then, oh, you know, I can, it can wait. Now is the time. It doesn't need to wait because it's for you. Come on down to this altar and let's start to get the smell of destiny and purpose all over you. Come on down. Next group of people I'll call, I spoke of playing with your destiny and playing with your purpose. If you have been playing games with your relationship with God, if you've been ducking in and out, ducking in and out of his presence, ducking in and out of his promise, ducking in and out of his word, if you're ready to stop playing games and get the fullness of of your relationship with God, come on down. Let's reestablish the fullness of your relationship with God. We're not playing games anymore. 
When there's a time to read his word, you're going to read his word. Come on down. When it's time to honor him with prayer and worship, we're not playing games anymore. Come on down. It's real now. It's real now. It's so real right now. It's real. And the promise that's over your life, when you acknowledge how real he is, that's real too. The fullness that comes from within, that's real too. The increase that comes when you stop playing games with the anointing that God has over your life, that's real too. When you stop playing games with a relationship with God, come on down. Come on down. Last group I will call. If you have not started a relationship with God, if you have not taken that first step towards a mind, body, and heart experience with God leading the way, let tonight be the night you start. Come on down. Come on down. I promise it'll work out for you. Come on down. There's nothing you did before this night that disqualified you. Come on down. Look at Jacob. Jacob stole his brother's uh, anointing. He had to go through some things, but God worked for him. God was with him. Come on down. God will work for you. God is with you. Come on down. There is nothing you have done in your past that disqualifies you from this moment. Come on down. Once he's with you, he's with you no matter what. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have drawn the line in the sands of time where from this moment forward, we're not playing any more games. Our destiny is not for playing. Your promise over our lives is not for play. The call that you've placed over our lives is not for play. Your word is not for play. Your presence is not for play. The worship to reach you is not for play. Opening our hearts to receive from you is not for play. We don't play games anymore with any aspect or part of what an experience with you is like. Tonight, Father God, as grown adults, we come back to being your children to grow up all over again. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to surrender it all. Thank you, Father, for allowing the room for us to cast down the crowns we've placed on ourselves that we may pick up the crown that you have for us. And Father, for this, from this moment forward, thank you for being with us. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for the promise that comes with knowing you will honor every letter of every word that you speak to us, and we won't play games with any part of that agreement. From this moment forward, we are changed, we are transformed, and we belong to you all over again. In Jesus' name, amen.